Well, uh, good morning or good afternoon, everyone, depending on where you're joining us from. And welcome to today's webinar. My name is Theodore from Business Review Webinars, and I will be your host. It's our pleasure to have Promicon with us today, who will be presenting this webinar entitled Mastering Neodynamics in Biomass Fired Power Stations. Uh, the speaker is Hans George Konrads, who is also the CEO uh, slash president of Promicon. Uh, before we begin, I would like to welcome you all to our webinar platform on 24. Uh, you'll notice that this webinar is browser-based, so if you disconnect for any reason, please just uh, click on the link that you have received via email to rejoin the session. Uh, in order to ask questions, you can send them via the questions widget. Uh, just type them into the box at the top right corner of your screen and click submit. We will allocate some time at the end of the session to address uh, any questions or thoughts that you might have. Uh, also, please use the yellow help widget if you require any assistance. And you can move, resize, and maximize any of the windows in front of you to get a better view of the slides. But now, please allow me to welcome Hans. Well, Theodore, thank you very much for putting me in. I'd like to welcome you all. I've seen that we have over 230 registered people for this uh, webinar, and I'm very happy to talk about uh, biomass and how to handle it. It's a very um, difficult top, uh, subject and topic, and um, our company has quite a, uh, quite a history in managing this process. Um, quite a few of you might know Promicon. For those who don't, let me just introduce you briefly. We're a company based in Barleben, which is not actually in the city of Magdeburg, not far away from Berlin, Germany. And um, our business um, is actually um, focused around optimizing thermal processes. Now, let me explain what, what these are. Uh, certainly, it's power, power stations. And thermal process management includes quite a wide range of measurements such as the measurement of secondary air to the boiler, so combustion air measurement, which is a big task that is difficult. Um, primary airflow to the mills, also the, the airflow through burners. So everything that's focused around airflow into the combustion chamber. Then, of course, the pulverized coal, or today I'm talking about pulverized biomass. I'm talking pulverized fuel. And as you all know, air and fuel are a yin and yang. Uh, they both have to match. Otherwise, you run into all sorts of problems. And with biomass, that's a special issue. So we're going to talk about that today. We also have specialized measurements for mill outlet temperature, uh, very fast responding. We have uh, dampers in order to regulate the uh, PF flow better. Um, we can measure the flue gas into the um, uh, precipitator. And we can also measure the flue gas on each side. So you can also try to balance your ID fans with our measurement. And of course, last but not least, we're also measuring the flue gas on the stack. So we can also measure emissions out of the stack. So everything around combustion, everything about around the hot process is what we do. And last but not least, we can also measure the unburned carbon in the fly ash in order to tell you what the quality of your combustion is and what your carbon losses are of your combustion. Now, <clears throat> the same thing we do also for waste to energy plants. I'll keep that a bit brief. Sorry, I'm going to jump back. In waste to energy plants, you can see where we are. Wherever you have air flows, under grade air on the uh, burning grate, a lot of raw gas, flue gas in and out of scrubbers and into the stack. So also this process we support by measuring uh, drift-free digital gas flows in and out of important process paths. Um, now, specialty, of course, of our company is that we can measure dusty and hot gas. We can measure uh, temperatures up to 1,000 degrees. We even have a new system now that can measure up to 2,000 degrees Celsius hot gas flow. For example, in a, a beta wheel mill in a lignite plant, we can measure the recirculation gas through a small hole where we can look into the process and then measure how much gas is going back into the mill itself. So we can also make a complete mass energy balance over that mill. 
Now, today, I'm going to talk about the pulverized biomass flow measurement and how to manage this process once you know um, how much your flow is. And that is really the core, the core question. If you have pulverized fuel, uh, biomass fuel, um, we have, as I mentioned, had a long experience in that. And today, I'm going to give you an overview of what we have experienced so far. So you can use our experience maybe for your biomass process in the future. Let's first start with the most basic thing. We want to measure biomass in a burner pipe. It all starts with that. I, today, I leave out airflows and, and all that because we have done webinars on airflows. We'll be happy to give you some links for that. Today, we're going to focus on fuel. Why is fuel important? Well, needless to say, the power of your boiler is controlled by the fuel input. Yeah? Especially in a PF boiler, the fuel input dominates the power, <coughs> the, the firing power of your boiler. And the fuel coming out of your mill is not going as smooth as water or gas. The fuel that's coming out of your pulverizer always has a certain degree of pulsation, of fluctuation. And this causes quite severe problems. So the classical way of measuring fuel with a feeder and then looking at the flame is, especially for biomass, not very sufficient because you have a lot of very difficult effects in your combustion system. So we want to measure fuel in the pipe. How do we do that? The way we measure this is by deploying a microwave-based measurement system. We have two sensors that are acting as a transmitter and a receiver. And one sensor is uh, transmitting a microwave into the pipe. And this microwave flows along the pipe and is picked up by the receiving sensor. Now, what you can see here is that we have two pairs of reflector rods. So what we do is we create a standing wave between those. You can see it here in the green area. And this standing wave has a maximum at a certain frequency. It's really a bit like a, a, a pipe of a church organ or a flute. You have a certain resonance frequency. If you now add pulverized fuel to the air, that frequency will slightly shift down. So we will see a slight shift of the frequency, which you can see below here. And that slight shift is corresponding to the amount of density or concentration of the PF. So with this, we are able to measure concentration of PF. Now, the next thing that you have to do, of course, is you have to measure the flow velocity. The concentration only tells you how many grams of PF do I have within one meter of pipe? But what you now have to measure is meters per second, right? If you then multiply grams per meter times meters per second, you arrive at grams per second. So in order to know the mass flow, you have to know the velocity. How do we do that? The velocity is measured again with the antennas that we already have on these sensors. These antennas are able to pick up electrostatic charge. So in your pipe, you have some particles flowing along. And these particles uh, are in the vicinity of the antenna. And as a result, the charge of the particle, the net charge, will induce an opposite charge on the antenna. Yeah, it's uh, called Coulomb's law. So you have a positive, slightly positive charge. The antenna will be slightly negative. The next second you have a slightly negative charge, the antenna will become positive. So uh, more charge, more signal. Now, the whole thing is this, this current that you see, the, the, the electrical current that we measure on the antenna, has a certain time pattern. It has a fingerprint over time. You know, It is the succession of clouds of dust going through that pipe. So it leaves a unique fingerprint, and that's the whole thing. That's the whole principle of the measurement. We can recognize over time a certain succession of signals. And if we now take two of these sensors in succession, we can measure this fingerprint at two locations, one upstream, one downstream, right? So what is the signal that you expect? This is what you get. You get two signals with a characteristic fingerprint, and you can see with your own eyes, these two signals are very similar. 
They are not identical, but they are similar. And this similarity is something we're using. We're now simply taking the two signals and we are matching them on top of each other. And you see with your own eyes, they are similar, but they are time shifted, right? They're not the same time. Now, there are mathematical functions that allow you to statistically evaluate this time shift. They're called cross correlation. So we digitize the signal, we put it into a processor, and we get the so-called cross correlation function, which will give us a maximum exactly on the time shift. Right? So the sensors have a certain distance and we measure a certain time shift. Yeah? Distance per time, meters per second, gives you velocity. Now that's it. That's our measurement principle. And this is very important because you now have the ability to measure the concentration as well as the flow velocity. And out of this, you're able to calculate mass flow. That's all. The measurement is a digital measurement. So there's no analog values. The clocking of the frequency as well as the clocking of the cross correlation is purely digital. And you will not have to go out in the plant and recalibrate every sensor every two months. You put it in and it will be the same calibration over its whole life span. Um, so just a little bit of a specification here. We have an absolute cold mass flow measurement. We measure individual velocities to each burner. We can detect deposits on the bottom of a pipe. This will be very important, especially for biomass, and I'm going to explain this to you later. The mounting style is pretty easy. Drill and tap. You drill a hole, you put the sensors in. All sensors and reflector rods are made out of very stable tungsten carbide material. They don't wear. You can leave them in for many years. And we have installed thousands of these in uh, worldwide installations. So it's a very robust technology that has been um, marketed for us for over 20 years, over 25 years. Now, how does the whole system look like? How does the system look like? You have a central panel. This is where all your signals run together. You have a local field box. That field box can measure, for example, four ducts. So you have four pipes. Then you have the sensors that are connected to the field box. And then you have a temperature sensor, which is connected to the pipe, because we need to know the expansion coefficient of the pipe, and sensor cables and the reflector rods. And that's the whole system. You don't have to exchange pipes. You don't have to modify pipes largely. It's a fairly easy drill and tap solution. Now, here a few technical, um, a little bit of technical data. I will not bother you too much with this. We have technical data sheets that you could download from our website to find the, the communication. Everything can go out by a 4 to 20 milliamp or Modbus. Modbus is our preferred way to communicate. There are quite a few signals to go out to the plant. And here for the sensors, temperature range usually 0 to 105 degrees C um, <clears throat> inside the pipe. The medium range can be up to 150 degrees C. In biomass, you will not exceed that, except for if you have a fire in the middle, which happens, and we're going to talk about that as well. There is ATEX availability for the system, especially for biomass. Uh, we've had quite a few clients that had insisted on ATEX um, conformity, so that's also no problem. Now, here we come to our theme today. What are the challenges in firing biomass? I would like to um, give you a little example of how the biomass goes through your pipe. This is the typical way of solid material in a, in a lean phase conveying. Um, it, it applies to coal, and the problems you see here can happen with coal, but much more they will happen with biomass. And the reason for that is that biomass is far coarser in particle size for one reason, and the other reason it is it has a far more um, fibrous uh, surface. So biomass particles tend to stick to each other. Biomass particles are usually not round, but they can be two-dimensional. They can be little plates, or they can be needles. They can be one-dimensional. So there are very many ways that biomass can agglomerate and form plugging and give you problems in transport. Now, here the, the typical thing, the lean phase conveying from the bottom here, uh, is the nice way to go. Um, as soon as you have a normal fuel-to-air ratio, you will see some roping. 
you will even see that with coal. There will always be some roping in the pipe. If you are reducing the airflow, then you even see some dunes coming up. And this can also happen if you're on a split point, biomass prefers to go into one bifurcation point and not into the other. You will have one leg that would carry a lot of these dunes. Um, and this is a special case. Uh, if, if the biomass is, is hardening at the bottom, then it would be like a, like, a, uh, like a solid structure. That's usually not a big issue. The main issue then is the pluggage of the pipe. And the plugging of the pipe in a coal-fired line is something that happens over time, and you can see it coming. With biomass, it happens like this. You can't see it coming. It just happens. And I'm going to show you some data that is typical for biomass conveying. Now, again, this is a coal-fired station, but you can see the typical phenomenon that in our measurement, if you have a pipe that completely blocks, you will see that the velocity on the bottom here, the pink pipe is the one that is blocking. The velocity here on the bottom will slightly go up because on the horizontal pipe, the free space gets lower and lower, so the velocity over the free space gets higher and higher. But the density that we measure just goes through the roof. So you're going to see a massive signal. Of course, this signal is not accurate anymore. It just indicates you, you have a transport problem. And resolving your transport problem in biomass is, I would say, 80% of the, of the job that you have to do to get good biomass firing. Um, Transport issues in biomass are the key. Yeah? So we're going to see a bit more of that. Now, what happens if you have a plugage? I don't need to tell you. Horrible picture. If that happens, uh, just run. You know, it's, it's a very dangerous thing. So I'm going to give you two typical examples of biomass systems that we have done. We have done variants of each kind. The first one is a biomass system that is a co-firing system where you have a coal mill, and you have a biomass mill, usually a beta mill or a cutter mill, and then you have a dense phase conveying from that mill into the coal pipe. So you are adding biomass. In this case, it was up to 20% biomass adding. And the client wanted to know how well is my dosing system of the biomass adding the biomass into my coal fuel lines. If you have a look at this, this is a, an old uh, 600 or uh, 590 megawatt boiler uh, with co firing. You had an extra beta wheel for the biomass, intermediate storage. The biomass is fed into the individual pipes by screw feeders at high density. Yeah? So we had screw feeders feeding it into the pipes, and we could see that the screw feeders were largely inaccurate and they would also not be able um, to. To, to make sure that the biomass was arriving into the burner pipe consistently. Right? Let me show you a few pictures of how the system looks like. It's a very nice system. Here you can see the, the, the milling system with the cyclone, um, the milling house. And then here you can see the screw feeders and the biomass pipes going up into the power station coal uh, lines. This house was separate from the rest of the boiler. Now, if you look at that, this is the house. These are the fuel lines. You can see the cyclones. So this was a completely separate unit for preparing a green pellets and then firing them into the bar. You can see the mills and screw feeders. And here you can see the fuel lines. And in the fuel lines, you can see here the Promicon sensors attached to each fuel line so we can measure biomass velocity and the biomass flow in each fuel line. Now, the question here is, of course, where, do, where does the biomass go? The biomass goes with this fuel line into the common pipe that then goes into the burner. So it was a co-firing, biomass co-firing. For us, it was quite interesting uh, to understand how the transport was behaving in these lines because the client had big issues with it. So we wanted to know the target fuel velocity, the target fuel mass flow. We wanted to see whether we could achieve constant density and no pulsation, because pulsation is your big enemy in combustion. Yeah? You make sure that the fuel and the air on a burner by burner level is exactly the same. But what do you do if the fuel goes like this all the time, you know, with time constants 
of 10 seconds, 15 seconds, your combustion is all over the place. You have no chance of controlling your combustion scope, right? So, and then of course, the right biomass fuel balance. Finally, if you get the transport right, that's what you want to know. And the right balance between coal mass, uh, coal and biomass in the burner. What did we see when we first switch on our instrument? Let me show you. This is what we saw. First readings. What do you see? You can see here from half past two to let's say 1440, it all looks pretty stable. It looks pretty good, right? And then we go down with velocity. We reduce primary air. We can see that we already have these dropouts and we have these high dynamics. And when we, when we drop out more, we can, get, we can see that we're all over the place. And we could prove to the client that between the first and the second step, there's a very distinct point where this whole thing is turning. It was two and a half kilograms per cubic meter of air. Yeah. Now, the lines were designed for four kilograms per cubic meter of air because that was a pneumatic design of the pipes. <clears throat> if you are planning to convert your coal-fired station to biomass, you should talk to us. Because it's one thing to design the fuel line system from the, from the mechanical engineering point of view correctly. It's another point of view whether to design it correctly from the process point of view. Do you have enough fluidization of your biomass so that it flows uh, smoothly? Yeah? And in sharp contrast to coal, biomass is hard. Biomass is a hard fuel to burn, a hard fuel to transport. It's much easier to burn than to transport. And that's what you can see here. We could also establish that our measurement was quite uh, well um, in line with the feeder, although there was a certain offset to this crude feeder. We finally arrived with this client um, at the fact that the feeder was nonlinear. And the client finally took our measurement in order to control the biomass power input into his boiler. So this was the first project that we've done in the Netherlands where the client says, I'm going to take this, I'm going to feed it into my uh, fuel controller for the mill in order to have the right amount of biomass into my mill. <clears throat> so um, it is very important that you understand what your fuel to air ratios should be. I know that there are a lot of mill manufacturers in the world that tell you this should be the fuel to air ratio. In many cases, that's correct, but you should check it because it depends on the flow properties of the fuel and biomass is very, very diverse in, in flow properties. So you have to, you know, to measure is to know. You should measure this in order to be sure. Is it really the right flow? And uh, especially if you retrofit your mills, it's very much worthwhile if you try with the first mill. Can we get the right flow conditions on the mill before we retrofit all the other mills? So finally, we proved to be more consistent than the banker weighing system and the client accepted our system for the control of his mills. Here you can see um, a typical spread, quite a, quite a few uh, deviations here, also because of the uh, fairly large uh, flow properties and conditions of um, the biomass. But you, you will see in further pictures down the line that a feeder to the mill it can be far more inconsistent than what we measure because in the mill, there's a lot of things happening that we're going to talk about in a few minutes. So how to control a co-firing system it can be used to control the fuel mass to each burner. It should be used to optimize the fuel transport. In this case, it was two and a half kilograms per uh, kilogram of air. This can be different at different biomass Fuels, but you should not rely on the fact somebody tells you if you transport five kilograms per cubic meter of air, you're going to use less air and it's going to be cheaper for you. Yeah, fine. Good, good, good point. But you are going to have problems to get your burners working correctly without backfiring, without plugging, without, you know, all this sort of issues. <clears throat> so that finally was what we were able to, to do the combustion optimization, control the O2 feedback, control of the Better, and the system was integrated into 
the control system. Now here I'm going to tell you about some other retrofit. This is a typical retrofit in Europe. We have various plants that do this. In Scandinavia, we have plants. Um, in the Netherlands, we have plants. Of course, in the United Kingdom, we have plants. This one, Drax Power Station, is a very large plant uh, that has converted four units. Um, to my knowledge, the biggest biomass fired plant on the, on the planet. And uh, what these plants are doing is they are simply replacing the coal that goes through the spindle mill by 100% biomass. And what are they using? Some of them are using um, uh, some of them are using black pellets, but most of them are using green pellets like this. So you don't have any torrefied um, material that's easier to handle because it's a huge amount of biomass that you need each day. So you try, you know, make sure that your mills can handle it. Now exchanging that. You know, just taking the fuel away and putting uh, the, the, the pellets in, of course, you know that doesn't work. You have to modify the mills, you have to modify the classifiers, you have to have different concepts of feeding the biomass. Um, again, here, Drax is a perfect example of uh, how much elaboration uh, an operator can go to to retrofit the station. This is a big piece of, of uh, process engineering art, uh, but we are one piece of the puzzle, and we are the piece of the puzzle where we have the flow conditions between mill and burn. I'm going to show you a couple of slides from various plants in this uh, in this presentation, not all from Drax, some of them also from other plants, just to discuss it a bit. Yeah? So you would like to, to uh, retrofit um, the biomass with, uh, with wood chips. Um, you have to elevate your transport velocities. That's the first lesson you learn. Now, all of you, you are all mechanical engineers. A lot of you are maintenance guys. You know that with velocity, the wear will go up by the third order, right? So if you have twice the velocity, you have eight times the wear. So raising velocities in itself is painful already. So how much do you have to raise them? That's something. Each mill will have different velocities. Some pipes will be too fast. Other pipes will be too low. Right? So in some pipes, you will have plugage. In other pipes, you will have excessive wear. So it is very important for you to try to match that and see how the whole thing behaves. Now, again, here we, we installed our system for monitoring the consistency of the flow. And I'm going to talk about that in the first part of the second um, part here. And then I'm going to talk about how to better control your mill. Because once you understand your misery, what can you do to make it better? What can you do to make your, your flow properties better than before? So let me show you a couple of things. First of all, the system is installed as I described before. You have the pipes from the classifier to the burners, and our system is installed in its pipes. That's the way this looks. You have a couple of uh, sensors. You have the insulation part here, the sensor coming from the side, drill and tap. Not a big deal to mount it. It's fairly simple to do that. You can find more documentation on our website. Now, once we switch the system on, <clears throat> we have a look at um, our flows. This is a power station that used to burn coal. And they told us we would like to burn coal, and then we would like to switch over to biomass. So we first burn coal, then we burn biomass. Very interesting for us. Look at the velocity measurement here. This is velocity of six burners, right? So this is your velocity while you're, while you're firing coal. When you're switching to biomass, these are your velocities. It's the same mill, the same firing system. It's basically the same, it's a light, slightly elevated air amount, but the rest is the same. Well, what is the difference? The difference is that velocities are all over the show. The velocities are extremely erratic. They provoke dropouts, they provoke mill trips, yeah? all sorts of issues. Um, and yeah, you can go on like that. You know, just take another example. You have a velocity here. Again, this is biomass. And this is a mill that has splitter legs. So they have bifurcators. You have left and right bifurcators. Yeah. So you have two bifurcators in totally four pipes. Now, can you see this? You can see, aha, one velocity is going up, the other one is coming down. Same here. One velocity is spiking up, the other one is spiking down. Same here, velocity spiking up, spiking down. 
So you can see that these pipes are trying to battle each other. And then, of course, um, with all of this, you have a mill trip. Your mill is uncontrollable. Your mill goes out of, uh, out of operation. If you're lucky, it just trips. If you're unlucky, you have to plumb the pipes free. And if you're very unlucky, you get a mill fire and you have um, a severe damage on your milling system. Yeah. Again, here, we have densities and everything seems to behave right. Then the mill goes out of operation. We go back into operation and all of a sudden one pipe shoots up in density and has a huge big plug and, and, and behaves very strange. Why is that? Because the biomass has a very high dynamics that is very unpredictable. It's a hydrodynamic system with a huge nonlinear behavior. So what do you do about it? The critical parameters that you can tell at biomass Coal velocities, 23 to 25 meters per second. Biomass, 25 to 30. We've seen 35. We've seen people even go higher than that. Yeah? Even though biomass is lighter than coal, yeah? it has, doesn't have the same density, but biomass by its surface structure and by its um, you know, agglomerating behavior is very difficult. You Instant danger of clogging without warning, without warning. We've seen that all over the show. Operators say, this mill all of a sudden trips, and I don't know why. Mm -hmm. Very important. So the, um, how do you control this? Once you see you have this problem on your hands, how do you control it? What do you do about it? Well, you have to look at the mill, because the mill is the only solution to your problem. Um, the control optimization needs to, do, needs to be done in the mill itself, and you must pay attention to the mill's operating envelope. So it is not enough just to say, what is the split of PF after the mill? You also have to see what is the air demand of the mill? What is the filling level of the mill? What are the internal masses of the mill? You have to measure them. Now, you can't measure them directly, but I can tell you a method of how you can estimate them with a control system. And then, of course, you have to control with load changes and also with constant load operation, the filling levels of the mill. That is one of the big keys in biomass. The filling level of a mill changes with more, with a little bit slower in coal firing. In biomass, it can be very rapid. You can have a very slight change with your feeder, but the output of your mill is behaving completely different. So um, the usage of a state controller is what we have developed for solving this problem. Now, let's go a little bit into control theory. I know this is very simplistic, so please don't, you know, if any, any uh, uh, CNI engineer here, you know, forgive me, this is not very detailed, but it's just a basic concept. What we do is we have um, the normal input parameters to the mill, which is the mill feeder, um, the, um, <clears throat> the, um, the airflow, the temp mill inlet temperature. We measure the mill outlet temperature. And what we do is we have a reference model that is running, and we have an observer that is looking not only at the input of the mill, but also at all the outlet pipes. So what we can observe with this is the time constant, the time transfer function of the mill. Yeah? We can see the step response of the mill. If you increase the feeder, what happens? If you reduce primary air, what happens? You can see the response of the mill in real time. And that is a very key element of this. So let's, let's do this a little bit in more detail. Our coal mill model looks like this. We have the mass flow to the mill. That's the feeder. That's the screw feeder or the belt feeder. Then we have the mass flow, the total mass flow out of the mill from the Promicon system. And it all goes into the error model. And what we get is a predicted output of the mill. It's the predicted fuel output. And I will show you later on how close that predicted fuel output is to our measurement. It's a very, very interesting thing. And you will see that the predicted fuel output can be radically different from the fuel input. Let me show you the problem in a simple way. You have a feeder starting. This is a mill startup situation. So the feeder starts up, and you can see that your output of the mill is starting up much, much later. Yeah? And let's say the dotted line is a Promicon measurement. That's what Promicon is measuring. 
Now, whenever in the model we have a very dynamic behavior of the feeder, the model will only take the value of Promicon. So in this case, the dotted line is very close to our output of the estimator. As soon as we go into a steady state, we will have far more orientation on the feeder. So this will really give you the real-time output of the mill at all times. And you can see later that this is matching extremely well. So what can you do with this now? Uh, beside optimizing your mill, you can also predict of how fast load changes will arrive in your boiler. So if you, ha if you have load capacity swing uh, issues, you can use our new uh, state controller between mill and furnace to predict when the coal will really hit the furnace. And with that, you'll be able to control uh, the, uh, the condensate pump and also the feed water pump much better in order to have a much tighter match between the heat dissipation in the furnace and the feed water. We were able to demonstrate, I'm not going to show you this today, but we were able to demonstrate in coal-fired boilers in Denmark that we can significantly reduce boiler stress because we can get the evaporator temperatures on the outlet of the evaporator much more flatlined because of our real-time input measurement to the boiler. Let me show you how this looks like. If you have a load change, yeah, you can see that we are dropping down in load. And if you have... Let's say if this is your demand curve, power demand curve, this is your real power output. You can see that there is a huge overswing and underswinging of the power. If you use a better controller, you have a far better control and a far tighter match of the flow into the boiler. And this is also what you can use on a biomass fired mill in order to get the amount of fuel to the burner that you want to have at the burner at any given time. Let me show you that. What we have done in many, uh, in many stations here is that we have a control model where we take in from the plant the PF demand, the mill DP, the mill outlet temperature, and the PF demand. These are all set points that we get from the control system. Yeah? Now, we uh, also are getting the measurements of the mill DP, mill out, and mill inlet temperature. And on top of that, we're getting the real coal flow out of the mill by the Promicon system. And we're also getting the real airflow through the mill. And of course, we're getting feeder speed. And what we can do with this mill control model is that we can give to the client a feeder speed demand signal. We can give a PA demand signal. And we get cold, a cold and hot air damper demand signal. And of course, we can give a real-time PF flow estimate. Now, these demand signals, and I will show you that later, these demand signals, if we do them with our controller on a biomass-fired mill, these demand signals are radically different from what you usually do. You will see a complete change. It will be different. So let's go in and have a look at this. This is a real-time data of a biomass mill, and I have to explain this because it's a bit complex. The first thing that you see here is a blue line, and this blue line is the PF flow demand. So the controller above says, I want so much load from this mill. I want the mill to go down. I want the mill to come up, and the mill has to follow, right? Then the other thing that we see here is that we have um, a summation of the Promicon Measurement. These are. This is this light blue line. Now, this is the same as you can see before. When the feeder goes up, yeah, this is the, the the pink the pink line here. When it goes up, it takes a long time for the PF flow to really follow. There's a huge time lag because the mill is storing in coal, and also there's huge dynamics before it all settles down. Yeah. Now the the thing is you cannot use the Promicon signal very well for controls because it's all fluctuating and it's all over the show. If you take the signal and you try to smooth the signal, then of course you're adding a big time lag. So there's no solution for using the Promicon signal to control your mill with a PID loop. Yeah? 
What we do is we take our signal as a feedback signal to our mill model. And so the estimator of the mill model can do um, the PF flow estimate. So you can see the PF flow estimate, which is this red line, is a very smooth line that you can use to control the mill very well. And you can control the secondary air very well with this. And you can see it is lying right in the middle of the Promicon signal. So there is no time delay. Yeah, the perfect thing. So what is our advantage of this? We can now say how, we can really control the PF flow out of the mill in real time. And we can give the operators a PF flow demand signal that goes into the DCS system. And that would control the feeder based on our mill model. And not based on the feeder function, you know, constant feeder function. I want so many tons per hour. But you will look at the mill models that I want to raise load so much. And then the primary air, the feeder, everything will be controlled in a way to get the mill to that load point as smooth as possible with as little overswing as possible. Yeah. And some of the stunning effects that we have seen while doing this is, for example, that on a, on a PF biomass fired mill, you could see that um, with our controller switched off, you had a large swing in PF flow. So you can see the red line, the PF flow estimate swinging up and down, up and down. This was when our controller was shut off. When we turn the controller on, you can see that the, the PF flow is far more constant. And this results also in a far lower tendency of the mill to clog the pipes. So the pipe blockages have gone down a great deal by more consistent output of the mill. Yeah. So you can see a far more smooth uh, output of the mill. And if we switch it off again, we're back to normal. We're back into the swinging mode. Yeah. Um, I have not shown this here, but you can see that the swinging of the mill is also um, in line with the changes of the internal masses. Right? So the filling level of the mill is going up and down. So the mill is not in steady state. It's much easier to do that with a coal mill than with a biomass mill. But there's another thing that's quite stunning. In the old mode, you can see that the PA flow is about 20 kilograms per second. Is that correct? Yeah, 20 kilograms per second. When the controller is switched off, as soon as the controller is switched on and controls the PA demand, the PA comes down by 10%. You can see, yeah? The average PA flow is, sub is, subsequent is substantially lower than without the controller. So uh, we have talked about biomass transport velocities, right? For biomass transport velocity, you always need higher velocity, so you need a higher primary airflow. So for many retrofits to biomass, you need a booster fan, you need more airflow. If you test this on a mill, it's worthwhile seeing what is the true demand that I really need. If you have a better control of your mill envelope, you might run the mill with far lower PA settings. So beside big savings on, <clears throat> on primary air power, this could also help you to have um, a lower upgrade of your booster fan. And of course, it will also give you a far more uh, smooth output of, of the mill. And you have less clogging and less uh, problems. Um, another picture to show you this stunning effect. On the left-hand side, you can see left of this red line, our mill controller switched off. And then on the right-hand side, switched on. Now, this is not perfect. We know that. But this is far better than the other way. And we have proved that using our controller on, on mill controls substantially reduces the clogging of your pipes, which is a, which is a major problem of biomass firing, especially when you have an old coal-fired asset that you would like to convert into biomass so you can be in line with uh, CO2 uh, lowering uh, strategies, etc. So whenever you do biomass, 
it's not enough to have a feeder and to have an airflow and to have a primary airflow curve and a feeder curve and you put it all into a system, you tune it and you walk away. You have to monitor what your mill is doing because if you change from biofuel A from Canada to biofuel B from the US, different forests, different provenance, or then biofuel C uh, from Asia, uh, whatever it's coconut stuff, or it uh, could be anything. You have completely different flow properties. And the mill will not help you with making your fuel consistent. It will only crush, your mill is actually only a crusher. It crushes the pellets to small fibers. The mill is not milling anymore. And then you have to make sure that you get these fibers through the mill to where you want to have. Now, this is it, what I wanted to show you. Um, we have done this on quite a few projects in Europe. Um, the ones that come to mind, the most prominent ones, would be uh, Armaga Power Station in Denmark, quite a few Dong Energy ones. Um, we had big uh, cooperation with Dong Energy, E2, and, and all these companies. Uh, big pleasure to work with these people. They, we learned a lot about this. Um, went, uh, did one project in Hasseby in Sweden. And then, as I mentioned, Electra Bell, Gelderland, uh, Netherlands. Then Drax. Um, I've put all four units separately. It looks nicer. But um, I can tell you, Drax is an, a, a super project. For me, um, a very, very nice example of how you can tackle monster problems and solve them. And our system was not the only system that helped them to solve all their problems. As I mentioned before, it was a piece of the puzzle. But I think not an unimportant one. And we are quite fond that Drax um, <clears throat> have worked with us uh, very intensely and we're following up the route to uh, optimizing the units more and more and save them a lot of money. And we also have done some um, testing at Mass Lacta Power Station MPP3. Um, I know that quite a lot of stations in the Netherlands are sort of in limbo. Um, I don't know the latest news, but it was always not so clear whether they're going to shut them down, we're going to put them in with gas, or we're going to convert them to biomass. I think the latest developments in the world have shaken the energy sector a little bit, so there are new solutions now coming up. We shall see, but I'm pretty sure that quite a few very big, very modern, very state-of-the-art boiler assets in Germany and the Netherlands show great potential for biomass conversion. So um, this is basically it. Uh, I, at, at the end of the day, just see where we have all been operating and working. I'm not sure from which areas of the world you're watching. We are happy and comfortable in any part of the world to do projects and we'll be certainly happy to do projects with you. The total projects we've done in the world, power stations, steel plants, and cement plants, you can see here. So maybe you have a nice problem for us. We will be very happy to help you with it. And that brings me to the end of the presentation. And I will be very happy to take your questions now. I will not be able to answer them all, I think, but I will answer a few. And all the other questions you please put to us in writing or just put them in. We will answer them by email so you can get the answer to your question, definitely. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Hans. Uh, great presentation. Uh, just a reminder for the audience, uh, in order to ask questions, you can send them via the questions widget. Just type them into the box uh, and click Submit. But now uh, let's just jump in uh, in transferring uh, the few questions you already have. Uh, so the first question to uh, Hans is, uh, what is the maximum just load for the measurement? Um, the, there are two things that we measure. We measure concentration and we measure velocity. For the concentration, I don't think it's a problem to have concentrations up to 10 kilograms a second or even 15 kilograms per second. Now, if you want to measure transport, the whole thing has to be transported correctly. So the velocity should be uniform you know, when you go into dense phase conveying, the transport always breaks down again. I mean, that, that's the principle of dense phase conveying. It's, it's, it's an it's, it's a intended effect to get to transport powders at very low energy consumption. But when it goes to burner, um, at, at these 
high loads, it's it's very difficult to find a, a co you know um, coherent velocity. So the maximum I would say is uh, for coal, five kilograms, six kilograms. For biomass, you can already see these pulsation problems occurring at two and a half kilograms per second. Uh, thank you. Uh, moving on to the next question uh, we have, do you experience wear on the probes? Um, the probes are made out of tungsten carbide. And this is the hardest material that we know as industrial use. Um, in coal-fired power stations, they last for 10, 15 years. It's really a long, long time that you don't have to take them out. In biomass, we see um, two differences. The first one is that in biomass, we have higher velocities. That is not such a big issue on the wear of the sensors. They are still holding up very well, and you can use them for many years. What we've had as an issue is that since the biomass comes in plugs and big, you know, big chunks, it has in, in, in our first installations, it has snapped off some of the sensor uh, antennas. And the solution to that was to just to, 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 to redesign them and have them deeper into the feed through so they are mechanically more stable. And that has basically squared away that problem. So I would say uh, the wear resistance is industrial grade um, and you can use it for many years before you have to replace it. Uh, thank you. Uh, another question we have. Uh, what is the impact of biomass moisture content on accuracy of the system? Uh, yeah, that's a that's a question I have to answer in two parts because it's a uh, it, 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 it's it's a tricky question. The first question is what is moisture? So you have moisture in various forms. You have you have free moisture. Yeah, free moisture are droplets of moisture. Then you have um, you have bound moisture or capillary moisture, which can be in fibers or in very, very tight uh, uh, um, um, parts of the coal particle or the biomass particle. And then you have steam. Yeah? So these are the three types of moisture. So I would say steam, we don't see steam. Steam is invisible to us. Um, um, capillary moisture, very low impact. We don't see much of an impact on capillary moisture. Um, free moisture. Yes, we do see that. So that's what we could prove quite well in uh, Helderland power station in the Netherlands. We had some impact on the moisture of the pellets because they were ground and then they fell down, cooled off, and then they were blown by a cold blower into the pipes. So if they had more or less moisture, we could see that slightly. It was a slight, it was a slight change of the, um, of the total mass flow. On a mill, you always have a direct firing system and... Uh, the, the pulverized fuel comes out at a certain condition. It has a certain temperature, and it usually does not carry a lot of free moisture, but only capillary moisture. So the effect on a direct firing system is quite low as long as you stay above certain temperatures. Now, all of this has no impact on your distribution measurement, and all of this has no impact on the dynamics of your measurement because that is one of the biggest issues. You have to control the dynamics of your mill more properly. Should there be a constant offset by the moisture. I've shown you in my presentation how to correct that with the mill controller. Because the mill controller has the observer and it will correct for that constant bias offset. Uh, thank you. And uh, we have another question uh, to you, Hans. Uh, from your experience, uh, the Promicon measurement can improve the uptime of biomass boiler and performance efficiency at which percentage level? Okay, that's the $1 million question, and <laughs> I like this question. Um, I, I would say that uh, uh, Mr. Kami knows the answer himself. Um, let me explain it a little bit how I estimate it. What are the problems you have on boilers? You have, um, you have slagging, yeah? You have also, sometimes in biomass boilers, you have tube leaks. Uh, Let's just go for the slagging. Uh, you have slagging, you have uh, slightly uh, too much O2 in your boiler. You take those two. You have a temperature issue, uh, slightly too high outlet temperatures because the slag uh, prevents the heat consumption of your boiler. The, the, the O2 
yeah, I mean, you just calculate, you have a little bit more O2, you are easily talking about half a percent boiler efficiency. So let's say half a percent, one percent boiler efficiency out of these two. Now, there are other big ones. For example, you have tube leaks. You have boiler downtimes because of tube leaks. Now, let's say your boiler is operating 250 days a year. Um, if it's down three, four days, well, you already have several percent of production loss. I mean, you can, you can, you can already see that any availability improvements are a very big thing. We've had clients with mill fires, with burner fires. We had burner tips burned off. You know, these are big damages that you have to repair. And that is a different, that's a different animal. So with the optimization of the process, we're talking half a percent, one percent. At a 600 megawatt boiler, we're talking a few hundred thousand euro, three, four, five hundred thousand euro per year. With downtimes reduction and damage prevention, we're talking, again, a few hundred thousand in repair and maybe a few million in production loss. So that's, that's basically the, my best guesstimate. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Hans. Uh, I'm afraid that's all the time we have uh, for today. Uh, if you did not get your questions answered today, please keep in mind they can be answered at a later date. Uh, so that just uh, again leaves me to thank Hans for what was a great presentation and to Promicon for sponsoring this session. To all attendees, uh, you will receive an email shortly telling you how you can access the on-demand version of this webinar that will be available uh, for one year. Uh, and you can access that through uh, the website as well, which is www.pmi-live.com slash events. We look forward to sharing further webinars with you. So please do keep an eye out uh, on the website I just mentioned. Uh, thank you once again, and I hope you all have a, have a great day. Thank you. Thank you very much.